we ready? Okay. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for the time, your time. I know time is precious for all of us. Uh, thank you for your time being here today and granting us uh, the per permission to interview you for this O State Storage project. Um, my name is Jacob Sherman with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is August 6, 2008, and I'm in the Angie DeBow room in the Edmund Lowell Library interviewing Dr. Jerry Gill. This interview is being uh, conducted as part of the O State Stories and Oral History Project at the OSU Library. Again, thank you for joining us. First off, uh, describe where you grew up and what was what your family life was like. Well, my early history, I don't like to tell people about it. I went to elementary school in, in Norman, okay. Oklahoma. <laughs> sort of my parents I grew up back on a farm east of Norman during the Depression. I went to grade school at Jefferson Elementary through the fifth grade. Well, actually, let's see, spent two years in Chickasaw, Shea, second and third grade over Chickasaw, Shea. And then in the sixth grade, moved down to Lindsay. And then I graduated from Lindsay High School in 1963. What was uh, your high school like? It was a probably small the, town, or was probably it? the greatest time of my life? Really? Yeah, why? Yeah, why I so? On, yeah, I played on the state championship football team. Was all state football player. Just had a great time. A great fact. It was a small town, uh, about four or five thousand population. I guess it was about sixty some odd students in my senior class. Uh, knew everybody in high school and half the kids in junior high. Uh, just just a great environment to grow up in. Uh, had a, you know, friends and hanging out, doing things you do, but it was a great time. I loved it. How many, uh, how many uh, students were in your graduating class? About sixty, somewhere around, I think around sixty nine students, as I recall. Okay, and you said you won the state football championship mm -hmm. from Lindsay High. Uh, it was like dying going to heaven. Really, what was that? Like? Football was the thing. I mean, it was a farming in, in a uh, oil field community. Yeah, and a lot of blue collar working families and. And uh, it was football was was a way of life there. So football was king on Friday nights. It, it was, and Saturday, and Sunday, every every day. Oh, that's you right. hate to lose a football game and have to go to the barber shop on Saturday morning. So that's <laughs> it, right. It was, a, it was great. No free haircuts that day. <laughs> we lost. Uh, let's see, one game of junior year, we ranked number one in the state. Got to beat the last game of the season, and that time only one team went to the playoffs, so we, our season was done. Oh man! So we won. We lost one game my junior and senior year, but just got the state playoffs my senior year. So. And did uh, what level was that? What level was? Yeah, it was class B. The double A was the largest class. And okay. Was a B C. Okay. For, for you know small school. Okay. Did you know that you were gonna go to college when you were in high school, or was that? You know, that's that's an interesting question because I've thought about that since. And I didn't think about it, but really, uh, there was expectation that I was going to go to college. The only question we had was probably money. And uh, uh, I tell people that sometimes I may be getting ahead of the story, but, okay. but Oklahoma State University literally changed my life. Being able to go to the university, I probably would not have been able to go to a major university uh, if I hadn't uh, hadn't been getting a football scholarship. Okay. You know, but I think there was expectation. Neither my parents uh, went to college. In fact, there's neither graduated from high school. And uh, but they were just that, that I was a pretty good student, and, and, and uh, I think there was that expectation. I was going to college, and somewhere, I mean, I don't know where it, it's become conscious, but by the time I was in high school, I knew that I was probably going to go to college somewhere. So. Did your high school prepare you to come here? It really did. I, I came up to an honors English class freshman year, made a B in it. Uh, uh, I really, it was a little bit deficient perhaps, maybe in math and science a little bit, but I felt really very, very well prepared, we had great faculty. The superintendent was there, he had been there when I graduated, he'd already been there 20 some odd years. Uh, the principal had been with me 21 years, it was a great team, they had a great teaching team. And my junior, and my junior year in high school, that was my third history class. My first two under my football coach was not very good. <laughs> uh oh, why was that? <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, it was read chapter three and answer the questions at the end and multiple, oh. multiple choice, uh, you know, test kind of thing and with no class discussion. Uh, but I always loved history. But my point I was making there is that uh, uh, my junior year, for example, uh, my uh, instructor, my, my teacher, in junior in American history, really brought his life when I really realized how much I did and loved it. But I, I really, my uh, my four years of high school English, one through English four were outstanding. Then I had an English comp course my senior year as well. And, uh, and they were really, really tough. Uh, Ms. Durbin had uh, ruled that if you broke one of the six major rules, uh, you know, subject, verb, 
relationship, uh, dang partnership, or an incomplete sentence or run on sentence. Mm -hmm. One of those major rules, if you scored an A on that test, but you made one of those mistakes is a B. Oh, wow. And so you really learn those things. It's really good, good grounding. It's, and I look back, I'm really amazed at the quality of teaching from the little small school we got. Did you have like a favorite teacher when you were in high school? Well, your old Lacey, I was talking about my, my junior year, he was also, I was a, a president of the student body and, and uh, I guess a student council, we call it then, but, but your old, so I got to work with him in that capacity. He was sponsor, but he was also, I had the, the history class and he was a great guy. Later on after I left, about a year, I guess, after I left, you become one of the counselors, uh, two counselors. Uh, Mary Durbin, that I talked about in English, was wonderful, was good, and Latin. Uh, just a lot of good teachers, actually. You had Latin back then? Oh, yes. Latin one, Latin two. Really? Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of that? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> it, it really helps with your grammar. You really? Learn verb conjugations. And it really helps you more in English, I guess, than anything else. Oh, wow. Now, now, did OSU offered you a football scholarship with that, correct? Right? They did. They did? How did... And I accepted it. Obviously. Was there like a recruiting process back then? Or uh, You went up for a visit, and uh, I made a visit to the University of Oklahoma and visited to Oklahoma State. I think it was my two recruiting visits, and I got letters from Cameron Northeastern. I uh, got an offer from New Mexico State. Uh, it wasn't like nationwide, but uh, some local interest, but I really... Uh, until I got the offer from Oklahoma State. Oh, you did not offer, but uh, Oklahoma State did, but uh, I really thought I was going to probably go to either community college, you know, junior college for a couple of years, play football, and then maybe go finish my degree, not playing football somewhere else. Did, uh, like, what was, at that time, what was considered, like, a junior college? Well, Cameron was two years school in Cameron, about two years before uh, I graduated and won national championship, Juco national oh, championship, wow. so uh, they were, interested in me playing there, so I thought about that. Northeastern and m still plays, uh, and possibly a full year at, at uh, East Central, but I really wanted to go to a full year you know, major college, so my thoughts were probably not have gone to a junior college, but really concerned about the, mm -hmm. the cost factor of it. So the offer of Oklahoma State University really opened up just a new world for me, and that's really where I wanted to go anyway. So, uh, What kind of accolades did you receive as a football player at Lindsay High? <laughs> accolades? I, you know, all backyard, I guess. Uh, they all, you know, small, you get the all conference. But mm -hmm. big thing for me, and really surprised, and I say that humbly and sincerely, been all state football. Really? Uh, at that time, there was, there was the Daddy Oklahoma's all state. It's only one. There's a coach who's Daddy Oklahoma all state. And I was really surprised that I, that I made it. Probably if our team had won the state championship, I, I was, I think, pretty good, you know, high school athlete, but I don't know if I was outstanding, but I ain't playing on it. You know, a state championship team helped probably get more recognition. That's good. What position did you play? Yeah, what what positions did you play? What like what position did you receive all state at? Of course you you played both ways in high school. You yeah. did the I mean, you don't now in the big schools, but then you played both ways. So I played running back and was of course the leading rusher and scorer, but also played defense and defensive back. Now did you prefer uh did you prefer playing offense or did you prefer playing defense? Either way, I just enjoy hitting people. There you go. That's the right answer. <laughs> Charge up that line. Bam! <laughs> Enjoy it. But, but you have to understand, I mean, with, with our group and uh, kind of put that perspective, it's how whole hay in the summers. I cut broom corn and work in the oil field, work on the pipeline. A bunch of us just blue collar working families oh, yeah. and grew up on farms or worked in summers. And and so it was a pretty tough group of guys. And and, and, and when we played people, we used to just outlast them. We were necessarily more talented, but we just finally wore them down. So, yeah, no wonder, so, like. I wonder why you won the state championship. We well, have tough like, guys. <laughs> a couple months ago, I met with Roy Goldston, who was our, our big lineman. He weighed 205 pounds. And 205 <laughs> nowadays is like yeah. a D bag. Yeah. <laughs> and our uh, Cecil McCoy and myself, we still get together. We're having a class reunion this uh, in October this year, class of 63 or 45th reunion. So, very close class. I mean, I was class president in freshman through senior year. And we were all good good friends yeah. and maintained contact. And, but our football team played that way. We really played as a team. And, uh, and so you really, you know, you watch the other guy's backside and you did what you're supposed to do and, and work as a team. And it really, a lot of my, you know, I tell people there's three or four major things in my life that are, that are significant to me in my formation, obviously my parents. And I mean, mm -hmm. sincerely had wonderful parents. Have, they're still alive, 85 and 86. Wow. But, uh, but I think team sports, and I say team sports because it really teaches you to work in a team, build a team relationship. And, and so those years when we really played together, it, it, 
it's sort of magic almost sometimes how well you play to make it. And so I, I learned a lot of lessons about life and about, uh, you know, from the discipline that you have, from the, you know, from two days of the sweat, the hard work, about hard work, discipline, doing things right, uh, being prepared, but more than anything else, of, of depending on and being dependent upon by, by other teammates. It was very important lessons I learned. Okay. Did, no, I have a question. What was the, your high school mascot just for the record? Uh, we're the Leopards. Lindsay Leopards. 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 You know what? Leopards never change their spots. Um, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Once a leopard, always a leopard. That's true. Well, now what's the colors? Orange and black. Orange and black. Yeah, so you didn't, you didn't change any colors when you came here? Since the sixth grade, I've been wearing orange wow. and black. So it's great. That's a, you bleed orange and black. That's a scary thing. <laughs> like I started to say, my, my first choice was, and I'm kidding, I mean, you did not offer me a scholarship. My first choice was Oklahoma State. Mm -hmm. They both offered, that's where I'd gone. So I was really pleased and excited about going here. That's good. Speaking of nicknames, how did you acquire the nickname the Blonde Bomber? No, I, I did not. That, that was, uh, I, <laughs> you probably see, yeah, I know. tell Jacob I didn't. Uh, that, that was, uh, what did I say? Bob Finnemore, okay. right here in 45, 46. He was the Blonde Bomber. He was oh, a great, great sorry. back in, I don't think I had many nicknames. I was lucky to play. So. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Sorry, wrong questions. It's okay. Uh, now, can you can you describe like the move up from your parents' place to Stillwater? Like, what was that transition like? Well, you know, first of all, like uh, probably any freshman, you, know, you first of all, you, you, you have to understand when you make the move just as a student, and, mm -hmm. and you did, we all did, but it's just a change to really step up in terms of the academic level, the competition level. I remember my classes are normally, you know, there's 10, 15 people in a class, and you come up here and there's 300 in a general introductory class. And, yeah. Uh, there's just the competition of everybody around here is good academically. Then there's the social where you, you move and you really feel, uh, you know, you're a small town, a lot of people, big schools, and I fit in. And, and uh, then there's the natural, you miss all your friends and relationships. You have so all those things that go on that you add on top of that athletics. Uh, my first day off of football, uh, Phil Cutchin, I was in his first recruiting class. Okay. And we had 44, uh, including scholarships, walk on 44 people in my freshman class. So that's four teams, and and when I stepped out in the field, the first practice, uh, they didn't know anyone's name, so you have taped on your helmet your name. So I've got oh, yellow, white tape on my <laughs> helmet. So after the first week, they did a depth chart, and this is for now freshman one else would play in those days. Just yeah, in foot, football you can just play sophomore through senior year. So just with the freshman team alone, I was fourth team on the depth chart. Oh wow, <laughs> that's pretty devastating. <laughs> So you have all of those things going through your mind, and you're trying to figure out, you know, which I could, I, I could, I could find more in the student union. I, I kept getting lost in the student union. Oh, it, was, man. it was bigger than my whole high school, mm -hmm. and so all the issues and adjustments you go through. But it's if you make it. it, it and Phil Cushing didn't let the freshman. I came up in August for two days, or mm -hmm. the freshman didn't have two days, but report. And the first time I got to go home was Thanksgiving. Oh wow! So it was pretty tough too. Uh, when I went back home, I got my town so when I went back home, uh, we had a modest, probably 1,100 square foot, mm -hmm. small three bedroom home. And in my room, since I had two older sisters, they shared a room, and then my, older, my next sister had it for a couple of years, but then I had a room to myself, you know. Mm -hmm. I come back, they converted to a uh, den. Oh, man. And so all my, all my <laughs> stuff is on the wall, and all my, you know, my little place in the world was gone. So I remember, you know, thinking, I don't belong in Stillwater yet. I really don't belong at home anymore. Where do I belong? So all those kind of feelings that go through your mind. Now, where, where did you live when you were first moved here? I lived in Bennett. This is where the athletes stayed. Oh, Bennett Hall. Right. We had our, our dining table. It was McElroy Dining Hall in Bennett. And so it's just you know, right across the, the road from What's, the field house. That was the athletic dorm then? Mm -hmm. Well, there's also the students, but certainly the one, a couple wings were just for, for athletes. Okay. Uh, my roommate was Halsey Marvin Sell III. Oh, nice. Oh, happy, happy self. Yeah. And one of the best things that ever happened to me, he's a medical doctor in Austin now. Oh, wow. He grew up in Corsicana, Texas, played high school ball there. Great, great guy. We still communicate regularly. But half an hour on the, we got a corner room, which I thought was really cool. And that was neat until I found out the corner rooms where everybody congregates, so it's hard to study when all the yeah. players in your room. So but it was great, great times. Great times. Can you, can you describe like the practices, uh, like the August practices? 
did the coaches believe in water well, breaks at that time or no? No, it's one of the problems the guys didn't die. Uh, you know, I'm going to say this, let me sound, it may sound contradictory. In a lot of ways, I have a deep respect to Phil Cushing, my coach. I mean, he was really, really tough. And, if, and, and, I, and I use this word, honestly, if you survive his practices and, and work with him, you, you're tough. Mm -hmm. The teams that played were tough. Maybe not a lot of talent, but they were tough. But, but the really, you know, he tried to be, he was Bear Bryant's main administrative assistant. He was with me at Texas A&M, you know, when they had the, remember the movie that came out about yeah. the, how they, the Junction the Boys. And, yeah, Junction Boys. He was one of a coach. On oh, really? The coaching staff at the time. He went back then to Alabama with him as his main administrative assistant. So he, he had that toughness and so on, but he, sometimes it was a little ridiculous. I mean, but uh, players talk, but really, who coaching was tough. In my class of 44, 10 of us finished. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, it was, and when he came here that first spring, I was still, it was my senior year, so fortunately I missed that. But there were about 90 guys on scholarship, 33 survived spring practice. Oh, wow. And we come out that fall, 44 in my class, 10 of us, you know, made it. Uh, so, if you if you survived, as I said, in the field catching, you, you made you a tough person. But a lot of people didn't didn't make. It. How long How long were the practices? Long time. I remember, it was three and a half hours. Three and a half hours. We practiced for about two and a half hours in spring spring practice, and uh, and I and I told you we had a lot of contact. We always started every practice with tackling drills, and I still got scars on my nose oh, because nice. he wouldn't let the running backs or defensive backs have anything other than a single bar helmet. If you ever hit a single party, mm -hmm. moves on you. So if someone gets your forearm, you get a shoulder pad, and you're tackling, or you bloody your nose. And so you'd, but you'd all bust up first of the year, and then so the rest of the year, I had a scab on my nose. And, and first practice, and you'd break in, it bleed every day. So he's like a hockey pretty, player there. Pretty, pretty, yeah, kind of like that kind of mentality. So, uh, but you, you learn how to form tackle. We you use your face and you, you tackle right. But we'd have about 15 minutes of form tackling. It's just one on one tackling. First drill after calisthenics ever, ever practice, but uh, that one practice we went. So we did all those kinds of drills, the grass drills, and everything you can think of, and all the contact for about two and a half hours. We were just exhausted, and and so he called everybody up, and we were excited. He said, "Now we're and this is only the practice for the same practice we're going to use right now." And he said, "Now we're going over to Lewis Field and working on the, the kicking game." So we worked another hour over Lewis Field. And you just you go in, you about to drop. And it's, it's all you can do is get in the shower, get your pads off. Did you do you remember any particular drills that stick out as dreadful or not what that well, you didn't want to do? I don't know. No, no, you didn't ever go in the attitude of something you didn't want to do. It's just like uh, a lot of people talk about, uh, uh, you know, about fear in a game. If you ever you know, in football and, and play a lot of sports, but you really can't have fear in play. I mean, and so you, you, it's not in your mind at all. But. So I, I never went in. I mean, I was sort of generally dread practice sometimes, but I always tried to get myself psyched up. So it wasn't any drill. I mean, tackling practice was always tough. We had what we call the outside drill. And the outside drills where you'd have a kind of a half line. You'd have a three linemen and a running back and a quarterback, and then you'd have a, a defensive end, a linebacker, and a defensive back. And so you'd practice sweeps, you know, how to contain yeah. a sweep and how to play off a blocker. And so most of our drills were live drills, like attacking drills, outside drills. And of course, you had your passing drills. and ones I hate the worst were just simply the, the ones that were just, uh, you know what my least favorite drill was? What's that? Calisthenics. I hated calisthenics for some reason. I just, <laughs> it's just, oh. just, all it did is just, you know, make you tired and you never accomplish anything. So, uh, but calisthenics, but uh, grass drills, you know, where you'd get up, hit the ground, get up. Hit up the downs. The worst thing, if you ever messed up, is, is, is uh, was uh, the whistle stops. And after practice, you'd run. Where you'd run about 10 yards, coach blow a whistle, you drop down, get in the stands, oh, blow a whistle, you can go about 10 yards, full speed, drop down, you can go into the field, come up the field, down the field, up the field. And that was after about two, two and a half hours of practice. So you didn't ever want to get those drills. It's, fortunately, I only did that a couple of times, but you, that's the back of your mind all the time. Yeah, see, so yeah. I didn't want to mess up. See, so yeah, I played high school football. It's not probably to the level that you played at, but I can understand, I can relate to you. What what was your typical like uh, week like when football season was going? Uh, you know, interesting. I, I had about a very very blessed Homer and I had the history department on. I'll, if I can, kind of fast forward and I'll come back. Okay. Uh, was real uh, with all humility, but very surprised and very excited that I, I got a teaching assistantship, graduate teaching assistantship mm -hmm. in history, with only having a three point grade one average. But and he, what Doctor and I took in consideration is the other things we did. Happy settled. My roommate, who was, was pre-med student, happened. I sat down and figured in uh, 
fall football, including time on the practice field, scouting reports that you go over, watching film, game films, which you watch for hours, and, and everything. We put in over 40 hours a week in football alone oh, wow. before we did anything else. So, and then, but you have to understand, as you got off the football field, and you've been, you've been beating each other up for about two and a half hours, you're just worn out and exhausted. You're really not always real excited about studying. I mean, which I, I always did. It was, fortunately, I had a good roommate, and we kind of disciplined each other. But just, I mean, mentally, it's hard to get a focus. Yeah. You're so tired to, to do it. But, uh, and you couldn't, you know, if you, if you got behind, you couldn't pull the all-nighters or, or the early in the morning because you, you just had to be ready for the football game on Saturdays. So the fall, but the interesting thing is I made my best grades in the fall. Really? Every year. So, Why is that? Figure. Just like you concentrated in time management. You really utilize your time a lot more. You didn't goof off. You didn't get both sessions. You was either in practice or studying or going to class. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I tried to do it. Did uh, Coach uh, keep track of his players' grades? Uh, uh, and attendance. And attendance? Yeah, I learned about the second week I cut a class, and then I was off meals for two days. How did you find that? Uh, he, he checked with the professors. Oh, really? Jack, so, mm -hmm. professors? They had an active counselor that was in oh, okay. And uh, Jack was good at it. But, uh, uh, you know, these days, you, you, would, you couldn't do that big cruel. You literally, and food, yeah. Thing. You couldn't you couldn't go into mm -hmm. McElroy dining hall. You could not eat, so you hit whatever you decided either a day or two days, or if you did a second time, it was a week. So you learned to go to class. So how did you? Even make... If you slept through it, you went to class. Ah, at least you were present, right? Yeah, you were there. <clears throat> how did you? Uh, so when he cut off the food from you, how did you? Did you have to go out to the yeah. grocery store, yeah. or did someone yeah. hoard food for you? A little of both. You'd scrounge around. But actually, it only happened a couple times. You, you, you learned pretty quickly. Now, was there a spring football here at the time? Mm -hmm. that, that was the worst. Why was that the worst? Because you didn't, you didn't taper off. And in, in the fall, you, you put on pads Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Usually it didn't have pads Thursday. Normally you had shorts, maybe short shoulder pads and helmets. Friday would just warm up and then play the ball game on Saturday. Sunday you'd come out in shorts and just simply kind of break a sweat, loosen up. But mm -hmm. so you, you, if you got closer to the ball game, you're going to keep your legs fresh and so on. But uh, by the way, most teams in the big, Big eight, we found out later when I played the old big eight, we only put them past Monday and Tuesday, we always put them on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Oh, wow. Full speed on Wednesday as well. But even my point is, in the spring, you don't do that every day. You're hitting hard, and they didn't have the limitations back then on just so many practices in spring. You could go every day you wanted. So normally then Saturday would be more of a kind of a weird, more of a scrimmage type situation. But, uh, uh, but you know, you didn't slow down. You had pads on six days a week. Was there a spring game back then or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was an inter-squad game and it wasn't as big a deal as it is now. Yeah. You, you made literally, the, the team that won got steaks and the team that lost ate beans. I mean, literally. Yeah, You really? take the team out and so if you were the losing <laughs> team, Phil was into winning, he was a real competitive guy. So did it, how many times did you eat steaks then? I, you know, I really don't remember, <clears throat> I think maybe twice and beans once, something like that. No, speaking of, excuse me. Now, speaking of food, uh, was there like a pregame meal, pregame mm -hmm. ritual meal? Sure. The night before or well, the day of? Or? Well, even on home games, you went to, we went to Perry, which stayed at the hotel up there, or motel. There's no hotel in Perry, but at the <laughs> motel there, and uh, even on home games, uh, just Phil wanted to get away from the distraction and all the people. So we, we, so we had a whole ritual. One of our rituals was we'd go to, to a, 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 a movie, a movie theater, and I think we, See, we went through, uh, I saw the first half of Von Ryan's Express three times, never saw the end of it. Oh. Phil, since we'd go in to, to watch the, and whatever time it was when we'd leave, didn't make news where we were in the, in the <laughs> movie we left. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of, so you always do that, then you had your breakfast deal, then you would, you just had a whole set of rituals, you know, you'd get taped, and then you'd get on the bus and go, and then you'd do the, do this whole set of, of just incredible having ritual of things you go through. So... You said there was distractions, like what was kind of distraction? What would be a distraction here at Stillwater? Why did you guys have to go up to? Just friends, neighbors calling on tickets. I mean, if we want to talk about the ball game to see it. Uh, Phil wanted the team together, think about nothing but the football game. So. Now, was, there, was that just <clears throat> normal pressure or was it yeah, intensified was. because we're here in Stillwater? Or? Well, I, Phil, I mean, but, it, but that, was, that was not unusual. I mean, most teams did that in those days. I mean, they, they didn't stay in their dorms. Or, and, and then used to, in the situation where a dorm were, were there with the public too, it wasn't like just an athlete going by itself. So yeah, that probably was not a bad thing, it was probably a good thing. Now, is it, 
So how did you manage uh, coursework and football? Like, let's go back to that for a little well, bit. You, you just do what you've got to do. And, and uh, you know, I think sometimes the moniker of dumb athletes is not fair. Most mm -hmm. athletes, is, if you look at scouting reports that they have to go through and the films, all the things that you learn, uh, there's a lot of incredible richness to what you learn and what you have to be able to do. And I think part of it, just because I explained earlier, just the physical, all the hours you put in, the time. Um, and then, frankly, and adding on that, some athletes, because they were good athletes, kind of got an easy pass on some of their courses in high school. And But I, I have a lot of compassion I mean, for student athletes, and it, it's tough to, to really, really tough to do both. But most guys I play with are pretty intelligent. We've got several guys I play with, got doctors, medical oh, wow. degrees, uh, dentist, uh, I've got a PhD. I mean, some of our guys really, really did well. So I, I just somehow I think that's a misnomer, really, about the dumb job. Now, would you, do you have any advice for like a current student athlete that you would give them? First of all, to, <clears throat> you get up everyone realize how lucky he is. You get to put on the orange and black. And and football playing in front of 50,000-60,000 people is just a phenomenal feeling. Was when I had been on an airplane one time in my life before I got to OSU and got to fly several places up to Lincoln, Nebraska, and down <clears throat> Houston, Texas. And so, you know, but it's just a great opportunity. And uh, I, I just, uh, I don't know if I'd really give any advice, I'd just say congratulations, but give it the best shot you got every day. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> was there any pregame rituals that you guys had, like leading up to kickoff? Like, what can you describe that experience for me? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah if we had about an hour, I mean, really just to, it, it's just everyone has their own deal. But I mean, you go, it's a whole, I guess probably all sports, but particularly I mean, football mm -hmm. is, a, is, is a lot more than just hitting people. I mean, yeah. you really have to, it's the mental aspect of the game. Uh, for example, from your scouting reports, and from all the film, you watch hours of that film, you have what you call reads. And there's, you look at formations and sets. You look mm -hmm. at how people are in their stances. When the first snap of the ball, you see what the motion is, what's the quarterback doing, where's the block back to the side, how are the line block. If the line are blocking down, come across the line, it's a run. If you're stepping back, pass protection, you're reading all these things. You're reading about eight or ten things in about two seconds' time. Mm -hmm. The thing is not to make any missteps. And Terry, I would have real fast defensive back, and I was small anyway. If you take one wrong step, you're taking two wrong steps because you've got to correct that step that you took wrong. And so you really got to get all of your reads. And so there's a lot of things are happening incredibly fast. And it's like a computer is, is hidden. And you're not really thinking about it. You're thinking, gee, the quarterback dropped back, the line blocked here, the back's coming this way, the pattern looks like it's coming across here. It's third and long, those situations, they like to do this kind of pass. It looks like it's that pass. Mm -hmm. Your mind just, it's just happening. It's all happening literally within a second or two or three seconds. That's all. So you got to react. So you have. That's what all your preparation is about. So you're talking about any rituals. Your, your ritual starts Sunday for the ball game on Saturday. Your whole life is, is a, uh, my whole life was a sort of just a, you know, it's, the worst time of my life was Sunday. You get up, you're beat up, you're tired. Mm -hmm. I had bruises all over my body. And sometimes I wouldn't be able to lift up my shoulder any higher than that because you're tackling a 235 pound running back. You got a 250 pound pulling guard coming yeah. at you. And so you just, <clears throat> the high, the adrenaline high, the game's gone, you're beat up, and you're just worn out. So Sunday is really just a real dog day. Monday you get out and you start all over again. Actually, Sunday night sometimes you get your first scouting report, so you start thinking about the game, then you're hidden. But as you get you get more excited about Wednesday and Thursday, you build and build, and then by Saturday you're just, I mean, you're really hiring a guy at your pumps and you're ready to go. So it's just that cycle mm -hmm. that you kind of live with. Now, did you, like, have any, like, Super uh, superstitions that you had to do before each game, or yeah, my superstition late in the fourth quarter, uh, you didn't want to be behind. And that was that was a bad sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I didn't have any. I mean, I, okay. uh, I, I mean, certain quirks and things you do, but I didn't have any. I mean, I didn't have any magic socks that I wore. No, you. And, and I did wash my t-shirt. You know, I didn't stay the same t-shirt. So all those kind. Of, some players did. I, I know. Did you? Do you remember any of them? No, those are more like baseball players. Oh, than people like that. Baseball. Not not real athletes. You know. No, I just. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> Don't say that. I, I love, no, I love baseball. I played. I played a year of Legion baseball myself. Oh, you did? What What year was that? Yeah, well, it's ancient ancient history. I played. Uh, Pee Wee baseball normally moved to Lindsay and I didn't have a baseball program. So I went four years and didn't play any baseball. And then a little small town Maysville next to Lindsay had a Legion program for okay. the first time. So Coach asked me to come play and I said, Coach, I said, I hadn't played in four years. He said, Well, I've seen you play basketball and football and I'd like to come over. And 
And, you know, I hit over 300 and had a, had a great season. Oh, wow. So baseball was my favorite sport growing up, and so I really missed it. Lindsay, you know, we never had baseball. The reason is, is the spring was for track, and track was really, oh, yeah. and track was really a conditioning program for football. Football yeah. was the sport at Lindsay, so uh, it's my, one of my sad moments is missing baseball. But. What was the, What do you think is your biggest highlight of your football career? Probably, you know, the one that comes to mind, obviously, is beating OU in, in uh, 65, 65, 66, get it right. But we had beaten like 20 years. Yeah. We beat them down in Norman in their, their home place, and that was great. It was the whole school just went crazy. Uh, President Com uh, called off classes the following Monday. We had bonfires down in Washington Street. It was, oh, nice. It was amazing. It was super. It was one huge party all over Stillwater. That, you know, that was a great experience. I guess just starting my first football game against Arkansas. We played at Little Rock uh, my sophomore year. So I, I was fortunate to get started three years, all three years. I was oh. out. But when you come out of the locker room, just kind of get on the field, and Arkansas just come out ahead of us. And when 50,000 people all stand up and yell, Suey Hog, it just scared yeah. the heck out of you. Know? <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 first, that first college game was, was just a, it was a great experience for me. Uh, Nebraska game, we played Nebraska really, really close at Lincoln and at home two years back back. They were we were leading them with less than a minute to play and they scored here at Stillwater at homecoming one year. Oh. They were ranked number three in the nation. So I remember then we let's see we were they were they were leading us twenty to thirteen, something like that. I try I try to think back there, but anyway, it's a couple of really great games. So I remember those games. Playing the Astrodome the really? second year that was open, played uh, Houston, that was a big highlight to get to play in Was that like a hot box back then? Yeah, they, they it was, a, a, and the turf was really bad. I wound up with a few strawberries, both my elbows and my knees, and wringing my head after the game. They didn't really have the padding under mm-hmm. that they have now, and the turf was a real rough course, because it, it's when they first created that artificial turf. Was it like, and it was really some bad. Some people say it's like concrete. Uh, it was like getting a tennis court and putting out a carpet on a plane. It was not really... Fun, but, but, it, but it's exciting. It's kind of like the first rodeo or county fair you ever go to. It's all, <laughs> all <Ooh>. nice. Yeah. <laughs> Which is probably why we got a big 33 to 10, I think, something like that. Now, is, now was Nebraska or was it Oklahoma the team to beat back then in the Big A? Nebraska was a good team. They were the team winning every year when I was there. Was that we the, played Arkansas three times, and uh, one of those years from Arkansas was national champion. The year they were national champions, they beat us 28 to 14. The other two years, they beat us 14 to 10. So, so close games. So they were winning the Southwest Conference and national championship. Nebraska was winning. And you know, OU was a big rivalry, obviously. But, yes. but Nebraska, Missouri was really strong in those days. And Colorado had a pretty good program, particularly uh, uh, but probably Missouri and, and uh, Nebraska. And they were basically Missouri running. Missouri was under Dan Devine then, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, let's get off. The football, I know it's great to talk about the glory days. <laughs> what was, what do you think was your biggest highlight when you, academically, right? Academically speaking. Are you talking undergraduate? Undergraduates, yeah. Well, uh, getting a uh, graduate teaching assistant was a real highlight. I mean, in grad, even going in towards graduate school was was very special for me. It kind of validated what I wanted to do. And my, my original desire was to be a college professor. I wanted to teach history as well. Really? So, get the teaching and that was really great. Uh, you know, undergraduate, uh, just a lot of, I just remember a lot of uh, really good people. Dan Wesley, who was director of student services at College of Arts and Sciences. Bob Com was my dean at the time before becoming president. And, and I guess really probably because of Dan Wesley and his arts and science orientation class that he taught. And he would, it was two hours a week and got one hour of credit. Uh, but I got to know Dan and, and we were both uh, United Methodist or background, and so I, I got to know Dan. He's a really neat guy, and uh, so when they formed, I guess it would have been my sophomore year, they uh, created a, a, a committee, and I, and I don't know how, but I wanted to ch- help uh, chair the committee of students in arts and science that wanted to develop the use of, of students as discussion leaders in arts and science. So one one hour that had a large you know, meeting of 300 people, so then it break down into smaller groups of about 30 okay. and have discussion classes. So I was an arts and science discussion or science orientation discussion leader, I think is the title, for two years, my junior and senior year was pretty special. I, and really, uh, I think, you know, I, I really enjoyed being in front of a class and doing that, so I, that helped me to, to think about teaching as a profession. So that was, I think, was, was key. Uh, 
my, uh, I guess, uh, getting married. I uh, married my high school sweetheart after my sophomore year, summer form, junior year. So that was probably, that was a big, huge right. challenge for me. And, uh, uh, but I'm trying to think in school. I probably think there's a whole lot of them that I think of, but, uh, but I'm not sure that you won. And, and I guess one thing I do take pride in is graduating in four years, playing football and still getting out in four years and having 3.0, which is, and I say that I, I've got in, in uh, yeah, I guess in full disclosure would, would uh, compel me to mention I really had like a two, nine, seven, three point average. <laughs> but I always say three. Doesn't three more sound better? <laughs> three point <laughs> out, get around <laughs> up. <laughs> anyway, so that's why I think I was very fortunate to get the teaching assistants here. But that was, was key. Now, what did, when you led these discussions, like what kind of topics did you discuss? Was it history related? Or? Yeah, just, just the, we talked about what the transition into college was like. And oh. I shared with you some of mine, but we talked about and talking about practical things, students would, would, would feel more comfortable talking to an upper class student yeah. than would Dan Wester or someone like that about, uh, oh, wait, what do you do on Friday nights to where the best places to hang out? Yeah. Things like that. Uh, you know, do you really go to class? You do, how do you, we talk about <laughs> things about how to study your professor, how to really learn what the professor wanted, and how to. We talk about some really practical kinds of, of application things. And, and I, I think the students, that was much more enjoyable, much more meaningful. Form than being in a class of 300 people and hearing some general stuff about college and, and you know in the university. Yeah. And and not in any way depreciating that and that there's needful, but I think they really enjoyed the practical application end of it. Now, did you join any other student organizations here at OSA? Uh, uh, Sigma Alpha Epsilon Fraternity, SA. Okay. I'm roommate now both Sigma Alpha, and that, that was funny. It was a little bit different experience because I never lived in the residence hall because my uh, field cushion, you require all the guys to live, obviously, in the uh, there with the athletes met at Hall. Then when I got married, of course, then I lived in married student housing okay. up here. So, but I still really enjoyed that experience and getting to know a lot of people. The fraternities would help me in terms of just relationships and meeting a lot of people. Do you still do you still uh, keep in contact with your? I do, but I really haven't been real active because because my fraternity is Oklahoma State University generally. I have been alumni director for 22 years. Yeah. And I, I really spent a lot of time with a whole lot of groups. So. Probably wasn't as close a relationship with some people, but it's still a very good experience uh, that I, I enjoyed very much. Like, I, enjoy, I enjoyed my first homecoming. Yeah. My in graduate school. First one I ever saw. Oh, so yeah. I enjoyed that's right. the first parade I ever saw was <laughs> in graduate school. So that, that was kind of a highlight for me to finally get to do homecoming and after football. Now, did, yeah, because did coach keep you away from? No, we were always, remember, we were always at Perry on Friday night. Oh, that's right. So, never saw him. Never saw him. next morning, so. Uh, Did you, as football players, because homecoming was so central to a part of the integral part of this university, did you guys feel like that you were being left out at all? No, didn't you, you felt like you, you felt like you really wanted to win. I added incentive to win for homecoming. You really wanted to for the alumni to come back. You really wanted to do well for the school and students and alumni. Now, did your wife go here as well? She did. Mm -hmm. she what was her degree in? In French. Right. She, you know, she taught. She just retired this past summer after 30 years teaching here in the school system. Oh wow, Madame Gill. Madame Gill. Yeah. <laughs> I told her some of probably just damn Gill. <laughs> yeah. Some of the students, but but the students tough. I mean, she taught junior high level mm -hmm. in middle school, and uh, man, I, I just she deserves a star in her crown for working with middle oh, school yeah. junior high students. But now, did you ever think about going into teaching, like education wise? High school or uh, middle school? Or? Well, see, I thought about coaching. You always get if you've been in athletics. And, and uh, uh, first of all, I, 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 well, I'll just say this: they didn't pay teachers enough. They wasn't professional. And uh, sorry to say that, but I, I thought there's some things in my life make a contribution and may not be teaching and coaching in, you know, in high school. So I, I thought a little bit of maybe coaching at the college level. And Phil Cutchin asked me to be kind of a help be a student assistant coach when I went to grad school. But then I got uh, we talked about it that after my fall, my senior year, mm -hmm. uh, in, that, in that spring. But then uh, I got the offer for the, uh, you know, for teaching assistantship in history. And so it might, you know, that might've changed my, my life there too a little bit. You never know, there's a lot of turns in life and you never know which direction you're going. But, uh, but I, so I thought about it, but then after, uh, but I thought I wanted to teach and been thinking about that. I got the assistantship in my, that was my focus was shift in college teaching. Now, did uh, did you what kind of relations did you have with uh, coach after you graduated? Very good, very good. good. I mean, very good. And it was, you know, the first time that you have a drink with the old football coach, it's a really funny feeling. Really, <laughs> but after we had some of our 
we call ourselves the Cutching Cowboys. Yeah. Actually, Walt Garrison was a year ahead of me, Jim Clegg, and really some successful people. And uh, so we, we continued to meet, and I, I'm kind of the coordinator. I, I keep all the, the addresses and email addresses and, and still to this day. But but the first time we got back together, I, it must have been, oh, 10 years after yeah. that or something. But when you, when you sit down there and, and really found out Coach Cutch was a really nice guy. Really? <laughs> but he, well, he really had almost two personalities. When he took off his football coach personality, took his whistle off. He truly was a very engaging person, very warm person, and inside of him that I'd never seen before. I wish I'd seen more <laughs> when I was a player. But, uh, but yes, he, and I appreciate all the things he did for me and allowed me to start and to play and the things that I learned. But, uh, but that, that was very interesting. How did he help you, like, personally-wise? Well, we just maintained contact, and I, I traveled extensively around the state when I was in high school and college mm -hmm. relations. Uh, assistant director, travel all high schools and give presentations, and so... He went down to, after he left here, uh, was, well, I guess it was, it was maybe three years after I graduated, he went and worked for Merrill Lynch down in Dallas. And okay. really made a whole lot more money than he ever made. Coaching was probably the best thing that ever happened to him. He retired uh, at the Coles on Grand Lake. So I could go by and see him and Betsy, his wife, because he still communicated with Betsy. She oh, was wow. a sweetheart. And uh, she moved to Tulsa recently. But, but I'd bump into him, we'd communicate occasionally in our reunions and sing. But, but no, we did our lives. I mean, I never. We didn't directly, uh, I mean, he didn't get a job for me or this, but I, but I didn't ever ask him to. Yeah. Did he help any other people with jobs afterwards uh, that you are aware of? He, he did, and then he was really good to his assistant coaches, and he's great for assistant coaches, helping him get positions in other schools. Okay, that's good. Now, what was your major here? Well, uh, I'll confess that for one semester, it was poli sci, political yeah. science, you know. <laughs> and I decided, gee, you know, I, I just I like history a whole lot more. Uh, it just, there's a discipline that appealed to me much more. I thought there was a lot more speculation in political science, a lot more more political than than, than I wanted. Well, they don't call it political science for nothing. So, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I, I realized the history was what I wanted to do. So I just transferred, I think, second semester of freshman year back to history. Okay. Uh, why history? Uh, people. People. Uh, as I look at one of the common denominators of my life has been people, uh, people that influenced my life, and relationships, and uh, you know, alumni association. We had a, a, our kind of mantra was connections for life, and it's true. I mean, you, those connections you make, not only connections and what makes you, you know, mm -hmm. success. I mean, just connections in terms of relationships and people, and uh, and I think history is really about people. It's not about wars. It's not about. Uh, Dates. It's not about events. It's about people and how people acting together, collectively, individually, uh, changing, affecting things. And I just history always appealed in that sense of history is, is life and it's people and it's relationships. And I, I just like that. Now, what what areas of history did you like most? Did you like Western? Or oh, you know, American referred to as cow chip history. You know, American West. Uh, I worked under Odie Falk. Did my doctorate under Odie Falk. American West, and then Leroy Fisher, the Civil War, and I wrote an article on the Civil War in Indian Territory. In fact, my dissertation was on Confederate forces, it sounds strange, Confederate Indians outside of Indian Territory. It was the refugees went up into Kansas mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Civil War. So American West, Civil War, American West were my primary uh, interest areas. Of course, my, when I taught it, it was a survey, American history courses, the early and the, the later both. Now, did you have any favorite courses, or what were they, or is this? I really enjoyed my Russian history class under Ospravon. Uh, not under Ospravon, I'm sorry, I had it under, a, a, oh gosh, it'll come back to me later, but it was just, he was, he was a second generation Russian himself. Oh, really? Second great Russian. It was, you know, gosh, I mean, that's embarrassing. It'll come back to me, but he did a, fan, just a phenomenal job, it's just fascinating. But we really stopped around the, the revolution. He really, uh, this was the, the Tsarist Russia. Okay. And I still remember his three tenets of history, you know, that he had. What were they? It was expansion to, to defendable borders, autocracy, and uh, monarchy. And uh, and uh, he, he, just, he really preached those. And I really learned an awful lot about the background, why Russians feel the way they do. And, and it was a good course. Uh, other courses, gosh, uh, let's see, Leroy Fisher gave me, I got a B in one of Leroy's classes in American Civil War, which really I wanted to do well in that class. Mm -hmm. And I was still a, a, a student athlete at that time. I had, had, had the course, but I really put the time in it. So 
he had a funny system where he, he 90 to 100 was named it. And so anyway, on the final, if you scored the highest score, whatever it was, it was 100, so I scored the highest score of anybody in the class. And so my average came out 89.5 to give me a B. <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember that this day. I, I went in and argued with him, but he explained to me that you know, 89.5 is not 90. <laughs> and so, but, you know, I said I demonstrated it. Yeah. Hey, I, so that was one of my, but I enjoyed the class a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But I, that was my frustration. I said, I don't know, gosh, Leroy, I know uh, Odie Fox writing course. Uh, did pricey writing where you learn to, to go from something, you know, we do like a three page paper, write it. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, it's pretty good now. Now I want you to do it again, do it in one page. And I went, oh, go. I think I did it, it was on the Battle of San Jacinto. So go down and start working, 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 work, just everything, get down one page. But finally, I got most of the basics in there. So he yeah. comes back and says, now write it in one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what he was trying to say is cut out all the words. It's what's really the story. And, mm -hmm. and I really gained an awful lot from, from Odie's class. And, uh, but I had a lot of good professors at OSU, I truly did. You know, some not so good, but I mean, most of them were really good classes. Now, do you have any particular favorites? Or ones that are like, oh man, I have to take this class just because so-and-so is teaching it. Well, uh, I had a, if I'd had one more class, I'd had a minor in English. I always enjoyed English, you know, I always enjoyed reading. I was a big reader. And uh, so I, I sort of picked that as my, you know, you have upper value related classes that you have so many hours. I took most of mine in, in, in English and Berkeley, who was, uh, Dr. Berkeley was, I uh, took uh, his course under uh, Shakespeare, some of his courses really was good. And, and it amazed me because I was an athlete and just couldn't imagine a football player to take one of his, one of his poetry classes, his literature classes. <laughs> but uh, and I enjoyed those English classes a lot. Uh, I think I'm probably missing some here and there, but, but those were the ones that come to mind. Okay. Now, what did you do to relax when you were a student here? In football season, you didn't. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you didn't. Uh, so, uh, so in the spring, every day, yeah. I guess, I, oh gosh, we'd hang out. Uh, you know, uh, enjoyed a lot of the, the, the establishments. I guess uh, establishments. Uh, well, I, I want to say beer joints. That wouldn't be right, would it? But uh, mm -hmm. some of the, the watering holes locally. But you know. We, do some of those things, but uh, I don't recall a whole lot. I had, my life was really very exciting because of football, and then I married the last two years. So mm, uh, I, not, I mean, I didn't have fun, but I, mean, well, but I, I was not a party animal, certainly. And, and uh, but but had, had a good time. But we'd hang out with so some of the couples, some of the people come up from from uh, from Lindsay, my high school. At, at, believe it or not, a class of sixty nine people, seven of us came to Oklahoma State. Oh wow, which is amazing, and so. Would hang up some of those friends too, and then and I think three of those got married. So then Susan and I married. So in our junior senior year, we'd hang out. We'd get a you know like a, something real awful like coke and whiskey or coke and rum or something. You know, so it was a big deal. Right, yeah. we get together as couples. Not, but I, I can't think of anything really that we did big time. Just little kinds of stuff. Did you go home often? Not very much. My parents left after my sophomore year. Okay. Went back to Norman, and so really wasn't you know much to go back to. Wow, it is dormant. Come on. <laughs> my sister was married, lived there about one more year, a year or two, and then she moved, and so we kind of lost our Lindsay connections. Now, have you, have you, been, have you gone back to Lindsay? You still consider mm -hmm. Lindsay your hometown? Yeah, occasionally, mm -hmm. it, it's still. Uh, it'll always be a hometown. It'll be a special place in my memory, and you know, that's where I grew up. That's where uh, you know I uh, met Susan. That's where you know we played football. That's where we did all the crazy things, and I did the like. You know, I, it sounds bad in some way. I probably just flat enjoyed mm -hmm. school and sports probably more in, in high school than I did in college because in college, a lot more pressure, a lot more performance issues. Just, you could still be a kid and have a good time in high school. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. It was probably the highlight of my, of my life was, was during high school. Yeah, I don't mean like my life was all downhill after that. But yeah. just in the sense of, of being uh, the small town hero and the, the knowing everybody and all the you know stuff that goes with that. And, and just just a good feeling. It was very active in our uh, Methodist youth group, and we did a lot of great things. Had a great youth director, and, and uh, just you know those kinds of things. I just so probably enjoyed that more than anything. Now, now, what propelled you to become uh, go for a pursue your master's and PhD? What what was there a, an 
epiphany is like, oh, I should go do that well, graduate well, level history simple, work. If you, know, if you decide you want to teach the university level, you know you got to get a doctorate. So it just it pretty much sets that sets that up for you. And uh, and I'm just a competitive too. And I just felt like you know I want to stretch myself more as an undergraduate. I didn't put everything I had into it. I had a uh, I had a 3.6, 6 grade point average in master's and had a 4.0 in the doctoral program. So, but it was just more of a challenge, but I was able to really focus all that into, into academics then. And so I really wanted to challenge myself more on the academic side of it. So it, I was really excited about going into graduate school. Uh, of course, the interesting thing, <laughs> it was another story for another time. Uh, when I was a graduate teaching assistant, uh, assistant, I was making $180 a month and was married. And so, and, and then had, uh, a year later, had the first child. And so we were pretty much starving. And so I actually, I sold Bible books door to door on commission in the summers to help make up money to go to graduate school. And uh, we had about 600 or so in our division. I was in the top 20 two summers in a row. And oh, wow. My best summer, I made like $8,000. And so that helped quite a bit. Yeah. Keep them starving. So, but I, I like challenges and like competition, I always have. So. Did you live in graduate student housing or? Married student housing, and then then after we lived there a couple of years after I graduated, I'm trying to think for what reason. Oh, I remember one because I was working the summers. Like I said with Southwestern could be selling Bible books, and, and so I, I couldn't afford to continue paying mm -hmm. the rent. So, and, and if you ever got out in the waiting list, you, you couldn't get back in usually. Yeah. Because I had really my athletic influence. My my coach called over and helped me get get in my mm -hmm. junior year. Okay, frankly, so we started renting places, and we lived in some stuff that I. I Two sons and two daughters, and I wouldn't want my daughter to live in some of the places that Susan and I yeah. stayed in. But you know, again, money is an issue. And, but but we never knew we were poor. I mean, there's, you know, you have, everyone around you is poor. All the other graduate assistants and the people you're going to school with. So I, I enjoyed, really enjoyed graduate school too. My, my master's program, my PhD. I was married, working full time, mm -hmm. and finished my PhD, and that was a different matter. Uh, it was just a grind. I mean, I would sometimes work all night on a paper, get up from the table to shower, and then go. Give presentations at high school even the next day. Mm -hmm. Those were tough, tough days. But you just had to do what you had to do to get it finished. But I really enjoyed my master's. It was I, mean, I was really into into that. I got I actually got to tell you this, Reverend. I got accepted at UCLA for a PhD. Really? Uh, pending on finishing my, my thesis, mm -hmm. but, I, but I didn't finish my thesis. In fact, it was kind of got burnt out. So we went and, and and made some money for a couple of years down in Texas, working for director of recruiting training for for chain of men retail stores and uh, and then actually after they were Fisher finally about two years later called me said Jerry said you only got one year left you oh done, wow. you've done everything but the last chapter of your thesis would you like to finish it up so so I finished that up aside <laughs> then really got you got to think about it again really missed it so then we had come back to university and got a job at full time with high school college relations so anyway long story but but uh, but it, but I enjoyed the PhD program it's just more of a grind it was more mm -hmm. of doing it but I really enjoyed the, the you know being the teacher and yeah. smoking the pipe and you know, stuff <laughs> in that area that went, went with being a, a you know it just a lot of fun. Now, uh, now was now what was your master's thesis on? It was the use of, of let's see it was uh, uh, let's see if we get the right title <laughs> and it's believe it or not I've got about a two hundred and some odd page two hundred some odd page thesis really? dissertation thesis. Wow. Well, Leroy was thorough. He wondered it all, and uh, it was uh, it was yeah. I'm trying to think of the title. Of, that, that's real. What's, what's important about thesis? You can't remember the name of it. Yeah. But he Dale said it's, you know, as we said the other day about digging up bones in one place and burying mm -hmm. them in another. But uh, uh, it, but but it helped Leroy with his, his he wrote his book in the, in the Civil War and Indian Territory. So I think I was I helped him with a lot of probably some of his. Background, but, Flush he, it out. but Leroy taught me how to do multiple citations and research. He was a great, great guy, and personal friend to this day. Good, good guy. But it was, it was during the Civil War when the, the uh, Confederate Indians, you know, the, they had the split, and mm -hmm. some of them went with the uh, went the north, some on the south. Those the, the Creeks and, and uh, Choctaws and so on, the, the, and some Chickasaws even went with the south were pushed out, and so they spent most of the so it's the refugees and all that movement on Pasco and whole lot the Creeks. They went up into Kansas. It, it was really pretty interesting. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those real narrow but, but kind of depth. So I'm probably the world's expert on that right now to this day still. <laughs> well, but it's pretty narrow deal of history. Mm, wow. Well, it's 
the, it's the everyone has their own little niche in this area. Mm-hmm. So, what was the what was your dissertation on? Was it the same topic or no? It, it was uh, completely uh, different. I really appreciate Odie Falk, and I know in some ways Odie uh, didn't in his career the way he'd like to here at Oklahoma State, but, but Odie was really interesting. He was a sergeant in the Marines before you know, got into graduate school, become okay. a professor. And, and, but Odie was a real nonsense kind of guy, but Odie and I talked about something that I could do that maybe would have a publication possibility. So we really moved out of my American West field yes. and, and wrote a history of OSU's involvement in international education projects. And, uh, and we did. We got it. Uh, Got, I, I took all, I took, uh, had about a month or more of annually built up, and then uh, Dick Poole helped me get a scholarship from the foundation. He was mm-hmm. vice president at that time, and I worked under that area, and, and, and it was, Dick was one of my mentors. And so Dick got money for a scholarship for about six months to support me. So with, over a period of about seven months, I wrote all of my dissertation, because part of his deal was you got to have it written and completed. We back to high school and college relations by September. Yeah. And I took off, I think, in March or something like that. So it must have been about six months. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we, we we wrote the history, and then I and Odie talked to uh, to Dr. Poole, Vice President Poole, about the possibility of then us getting something that we could publish and, and having some money to do that. So we published it through the Oklahoma State University Press. What was and, the uh, What was the title of that? The Great Adventure. And then we read. And then we added a chapter to at the end of an updated. It's now in our you know in the, the history did on the, the Centennial Histories. Yes. That we did series. Uh, it's it's the international history volume, so we updated it. So it's actually been published twice. Oh, so, uh, pretty pretty neat. You get two publications out of your dissertation, right? Nice, <laughs> nice. All right, we're back here with uh, Jerry Gill. We're still in the Andrew Jabot room, and we're discussing his graduate student work. Uh, basically, where did we leave off? We're talking about dissertation. Oh, dissertation, and it being published. Uh, it was actually published twice. Which you, we published it as a great adventure, and. It, by Oklahoma State University Press, mm-hmm. they, they had done the Will Rogers series, and it was kind of a small operation, but had uh, put some money to do that. Then we updated it, uh, that was in 76, I guess, when I finished my doctorate, so it would have been around 77 or something when we published it. But then in, in the 90s, early 90s, we turned around and, and up, added a, a chapter and updated it, and it's in this, the uh, Centennial History series of 23, 24 volumes. And, okay. and the title of it is, is International Education. Now, what, so it dealt with uh, international programs that... Yeah. Dr. Henry G. Bennett, you know, he was uh, the director of the Point Four program, which is a predecessor for, uh, for our kind of, if you will, the USAID. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, he stepped down as president, he took leave of absence, and chaired that under, uh, under uh, President Truman, Harry Truman, and uh, really got an Oklahoma State started the Ethiopian program. Yeah. And uh, a lot of programs in uh, Thailand. I was just back to Thailand in uh, late June for two weeks. We, we have several hundred Thai alumni, OSU alumni in Thailand. Mm-hmm. We, have a OSU, we have an alumni association, OSU alumni association oh, really? out of Thailand. Really? So anyway, but there and, and uh, we've, there are a couple home, ec- home economics colleges in Karachi and Lahore, uh, Pakistan, and uh, the NSC or the South America, extensive in Brazil, but, in, but real extensive. OSU has been involved, still continues to be involved in international programs. That's a very interesting facet of, of OSU history, and, and Henry G. Bennett really saw international education as, an, as just a natural outreach of the land grant philosophy yeah. you know, of educating you know, people. Now, now, Bennett died in Tehran. Was it? Plane crash. Was, he, was he working on the program at that time? He was visiting, and it was an international trip, and he and his wife, and kind of his, uh, one of his main sort of not press agent, one of his main administrative uh, aides. Killed. Now, how did you get in onto this topic? Did was there? Did you see? Oh, we, this should be written about, or mm, we just we sit down with uh, Odie Falk and, and talk about some aspects of our history and and what would what would be you know, pre- of mm-hmm. interest and, and general interest to public and be publishable, and that was some of the topics that we that come up with. And I I had a, picked up a little bit of that in some of my studies I'd done as a you know, graduate school. Now. Uh, now, did your master's thesis ever get published, or no? Did not. What you wanted to get published, or because it well, sounds like a fascinating it's not, topic. Uh, you know what I wanted to share. I mean, probably everybody would, I guess, anything to write that's publishable. It, it just, uh, it really it doesn't have enough general appeal, mm-hmm. and I'll take away from it historically, but just a general appeal. And like I said, it was very, very thorough. It was 
guy, I'm trying to remember now, 200 some odd pages. Is a, you know, more yeah. most theses are you know, 150 some are smaller. Yes. The dissertation is larger, but it was around 200 and I think 30, 40, 50 pages in length. So it was pretty definitive, but would not have a, a large general interest okay. to, to enough people to be worth product publishing. Okay. Now, what can we, as students of history, what can we, what do you think we can learn from both topics, your master's thesis and your dissertation topic? Well, you know, <laughs> let's get back to reality. I mean, mo most theses and even dissertation, certain theses, aren't really done to be to be published. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. but what they are is it, it's it's a twofold. If usually the, the person is what they learn about teaching, you really learn about about historiography. You learn about. Mm -hmm footnoting and documentation. I mean, you're learning that through graduate school. I mean, in your coursework also, it really comes in culmination yes. that you're learning how to research, write, document, go to, to primary source records, to go to libraries, to, to uh, uh, archives. And, uh, and, and so, so it's, it's a learning mm -hmm. process that that person can go through to become a professional historian. So it's not really, when you're writing a thesis, you're not really writing it normally for publication purposes. Yes. The other part is though, you are writing it to perhaps then take some narrow niche of history and, and put together uh, salient facts and, and the information about it. And normally what happens is that other professors, other people in, the, in that narrow field will pick up on some of that. Normally the interesting thing is theses are rarely ever quoted, but they use them a lot. Mm -hmm. But they'll go back to your primary sources and quote your primary sources. The time is fine, that's what we all do. Yes. Uh, so, so no, I mean, you're not disappointed, you expect it to be published. It's, but the purpose again is twofold. And I, and I got it. What I wanted to work with Leroy Fisher, which is wonderful. Leroy is, uh, uh, you know, the old German boy, specific, and, and mm -hmm. I really learned about it. And when we sat down, first time I, uh, he, agreed, he agreed to co author a, an article with me on a similar yeah. paper that I wrote in his class. And he really did it not to get a publication, it went Leroy to, to, to train me. So I remember sitting down and he said, Well, well Jerry said, you had already gotten a course, and the course was over. And, we, and so a month later, we started working together to get it up to publication yes. standards. And so, he said, well, bring in your documents, you know, for, you know, and I want to see them for your article. So I go through it. I've, I've got my photocopy documents, you Xerox copy documents, et cetera. I mean, I, you know, every bit of it. I mean, I, I had it for every foot on citation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, Mr. Gill, you, you don't understand. I want to see the books. I want to see the journals. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back and get every book, every <laughs> journal, and physically, you know, look at it. Uh, so very thorough, and I learned about multiple citations and how to use them and when not to use it's a great experience. How now when you were at when you were doing your PhD, did you was this when the program was in its initial birth? Yeah, it was one of the early ones that I had. Uh, uh, Paul Lambert uh, had worked with the Oklahoma Heritage Association for several years. Uh, Bob Blackburn, mm -hmm. who was executive director of the, of the Oklahoma Historical you know, uh, Association Society, rather. Uh, we were all three in grad school together. I think the first PhD candidate was, I think, Joe Stout, I think, got the first PhD, either the first or second year in the state. But it was in early years when I was doing my master's. When I first started my master's program, we did not have a PhD program yeah. at the time. So this was in the early 70s, I guess, mm -hmm. when come to the PhD program. Speaking of that time period, did was there effects about the, was there, did the Vietnam War have an effect on campus? What was the campus climate at that time? Sure, uh, and I really, it's interesting, uh, you know, I miss most of the, the, the activist kind of era, and that was more late 60s here when mm -hmm. I graduated. It wasn't too much, we're, you know, everything happens about five years later in Oklahoma than it does in everyone else in the yeah. country. But, uh, but really in the early 60s, it was building nationally, but it didn't really hit it in the late 60s. I was in graduate school, married, mm -hmm. you know, and then even Santa Cruz in football. I was engaged, didn't have the time to engage in a lot of those kinds of things. So it did, but but it, it reached the campus and there was protests and you know it was out on the on the, on the library mall and so on. But I really mean, honestly was not very much engaged in any of that. I was still sort of kind of a distance. A distance. Now is there? Now what kind of campus was this? Was it still more conservative or was it liberal at that time period or no? Never been liberal. Never been liberal? <laughs> yes. And you, you said the right word still concerned. And, and, and I'm not saying it's a political issue left to right. I mean, that's yeah. all my thought process. and Social and issues. It, yeah. It's probably more conservative. Uh, and I don't mean, uh, you know, arts conservative or anything, mm -hmm. but the 
probably, I think, in Oklahoma, it just reflects probably the people of Oklahoma more. It's a fairly, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. I mean, the values are more traditional. Uh, there's more in terms of a discipline, work ethic, uh, uh, where you conduct your life. I mean, when you look at the world, it's just a little different, I think, than living on probably the East or West Coast. Mm-hmm. Still to this day, and probably even more so maybe in the 60s. So we really didn't, the, the, the Vietnam era, and, and that wave of the 60s and early 70s didn't impact us, but not the extent that it probably did a lot of universities. Yeah. Now, was it, now, in that sense, do you think that campus was pro-war or? No, I don't think any students were pro-war really well. I mean, I, where we, now, you said pro-war. The difference between pro-war and supporting the, the Soviet yeah. thing, most people were supporting the Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people not supported, of, of the, I mean, of the, of the, of the troops there, but yeah. not supported of the, of the war. Generally. Okay. So, now what what do you think when you think of Oklahoma State University? What what stands out the most? What in your mind? What like instantly pops into your head? Well, uh, on a personal note, and yeah. I said earlier, thing stands out to me about it is the special place it, it has in my heart. I mean, it changed my life. It truly did. I mean, I, going to school here at Oklahoma State uh, impacted the rest of what's happened in my life. And mm-hmm. you know, I've worked at the university thirty four years. And three degrees from here, so obviously that'd be so, but I, I think even people that hear four or five years undergraduate degree, there's just a, a, a feeling about being at Oklahoma State is very special. The next thing I think is, we talked about earlier, about people, mm-hmm. and and it's a, when I think about Oklahoma State University, I think about the people, certainly the student athletes, student athletes are part of the student body uh, in graduate school people, and I just mentioned several names to you in our, our conversation here, but then even more so as a Working Alumni Association is uh, president and CEO over 22 years. Uh, and I literally know thousands of alumni, and, and a lot of them are very special in their ways and wonderful people. And, I, and so you, you think of, a, of an institution like Oklahoma State, I think of faculty and staff who, who make a difference in people's lives, even right now, I mean, every day. Uh, you think of all the alumni that go out and make an impact on the world, what's happened to them. So I, I think of people really, when I think about it, I think about Oklahoma State University. Do you think that overall the university is headed in a good direction, bad direction? Oh, I, I think good direction. It, it's it's uh, uh, you know when I when I would talk to students about coming to Oklahoma State University when I was in high school and college relations, now called undergraduate admissions mm-hmm. office. But by coming here, I, I would suggest that they narrow it down to you know, maybe three or four schools that they're really interested in yes. and go visit those campuses. And if you knew someone who's there that they could even spend the night with, I mean, get involved in campus activities and really get a feel for it. In Oklahoma State University, I tell them it surprises them sometimes. I say Oklahoma State is not for everybody. We don't try to be, mm-hmm. but but here's what we are. And if you like that environment, and I think there's a special environment when people come to Oklahoma State and really give it a good look and get a sense because of the people. The, so I like the friendliness, I like the, the caring that's there. Not not always, but I think generally uh, is really very enticing to people. And uh, so I think Oklahoma State has had that all along. But I think adding on to that now, I think. We're really coming out of it in terms of, of the developments on campus now, but it's been happening for many years. I think the, the growth and the status and the fact mm-hmm. that uh, quality of our faculty, you know, teaching faculty particularly, but research as well, uh, and, you know, facilities, things we're doing. Uh, I mean, and certainly being part of the Big 12 has helped us more than just athletically. I mean, there's a lot of academic things that yes. happen and clusters around the Big 12. So I think being part of that environment of most universities recognized as a but I think what we truly are is just is an out, and I don't rank school. We're an outstanding land grant university, mm-hmm. and, and everything that means that's our mission, and we need to continue to stick to our mission and try to do it well. But but I I, I think Oklahoma State is recognized regionally, nationally, and, and because of our activities uh, internationally in the world. So there's a lot to be proud of about Oklahoma State. Now, now is there anything you would like to add that we discussed and possibly want to? Flush out more? Or? No, probably, probably rambling a lot more than you wanted to hear. <laughs> uh, it's just, I guess, in, in, in conversations, it's difficult to have conversations about yourself. I mean, I'd really, a lot rather talk about other people. Mm-hmm. But but I think, in, in one way, my story probably is, is similar to a lot of other people who said earlier is the impact that Oklahoma State University has had on my life. And I, I think the impact it's had on tens and tens of thousands of lives. Uh, and that's what's special about a, a, a university because of the, the impact you make, but a land grant university the impact it makes through teaching and through instruction, you know, talking about, but also through research that 
the products and the processes and the things that are discovered that help people's lives. And then the extension or outreach programs that we have, particularly you know, through 77 counties, but in all areas where we take that knowledge and information out to help people. And, uh, and that's sort of in a sense what Energy Bed did even on the international level mm -hmm. with our programs. And so I, I think that, that the thing about my life that has really been special to me, and I look back on that we've changed it all, is that all I sometimes would have wanted to be more active and involved yes. in the academic end of it, but my role is to support that and to help those things happen, whether it be fundraising, connecting people to the university, helping recruit students, give students some way, give back to Oklahoma State. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and I, regardless of what I give in my career, I can never give back as much as they give me, but I, but I think my story is not, I mean, most of them are going to work for the university in third or four years, but I still think a lot of alumni have had the same story about what Oklahoma State University did for them and their lives and what they give back in terms of OSU. And then again, I think it's kind of special about our school. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Right. I do appreciate it. And hopefully, I think we'll probably end, eventually end up doing an interview about your foundation career. Just assuming. But I thank you for your time and uh, okay. have a good day. Enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you.